thank you very, very much for that very kind uh, introduction. I'm, uh, I'm deeply honored to be here, and I want to particularly thank uh, Professor Cicerone for having invited me to be here. And uh, I'm, I'm honored that you would ask me to provide your annual address today. I know that over the past decade, students at Bridgewater State College have heard from several dynamic Canadians, all leaders in their field. And I know that they gave you some compelling food for thought. Today, like them, I want to challenge you. I want you to consider how the world and its peoples are changing with technological innovation and emerging democratic trends. I hope to give you a fresh perspective on the dynamic interplay between these two forces. And I want you to come away from my talk with a fuller appreciation of your role and the essential role that all universities, including Bridgewater State, must play in shaping our world and in influencing the people who live on it. That's because I believe that you can, should, and must make a difference. But it won't be easy or simple. Your world is vastly different from the world that I grew up in. When I was your age, for example, radio was the must-have technology, and television was the next big thing to come. We didn't have pocket calculators, let alone computers. Most telephones were black, and all of them plugged into a wall. That's a far cry from the way that it is today. In less than a generation, just 15 years, the web, email, and cell phones have come to dominate economics and to revolutionize the way that we work and the way that we live. I can't even imagine anymore what my life would be like without my Blackberry. I also grew up in a sea of white faces. My family was the only black family in the small town of Wolfville, Nova Scotia, where my father was a janitor. Yet today, when I walk down the streets of Toronto, Canada's largest city, every fifth person I meet is a person of color, and in just a few years, people of color will outnumber white people in Toronto. In Canada, we use a phrase called visible minorities, and the word visible minorities refers under our government statutes to mean people who are non-Caucasian. I think that diversity and digitalization are not only changing the way we live and work, they are shaping the way that we think and feel, and as such, their impact will be more profound than we can ever imagine. As leaders, both in today's centers of learning and as leaders in the future, you cannot sit back and be content to watch events unfold. You must get engaged. You must become agents of change, agents of positive and lasting change. To give you an idea of the extent of the global transformation underway, I will first touch on the changes underway in Canada from a demographic perspective. That's because, in a very real way, Canada serves as a microcosm for what's happening worldwide. Second, I would like to share with you how technologies are shaping our information society. Early on, just like Americans, Canadians pioneered many new information and communications technologies, and this ingenuity continues to propel innovation but new crucibles of innovation and ingenuity are bubbling up throughout the world. How will North Americans continue to play a key role in the future? And third, I would like to outline the major challenges facing universities and state colleges and our collective societies moving forward. In that context, I will share with you what I think you can and should and must do. So first, let's take a look at how Canada's mosaic is changing. Today, Canada is the most ethnically diverse country in the world. Other countries such as Australia, Luxembourg, and Switzerland have more foreign-born citizens, but those countries do not have foreign populations that are as diversified as Canada's. For instance, the results of Canada's 2006 census show that more than 200 different ethnic groups now call Canada home 
and more than 200 different languages are spoken in Canada today. So just walk down the streets of Vancouver, Toronto, or Montreal, and you will hear all the languages of the world being, being, being spoken as Canadians. The census further reveals that 83.9% of the immigrants who arrive in Canada between 2001 and 2006 were born in regions other than Europe a dramatic departure from the immigration patterns of just three decades ago. Even more telling, more than five million Canadians now make up Canada's visible minority population, representing 16.2% of the total population of Canada. Now that's based on the 2006 statistics. I think that we're closer to 20% today. At the rate of growth of the visible minority population between 2001 and 2006, was 27.2%, five times faster than the 5.4% increase for the population as a whole. Most Canadians appear to welcome our nation's growing diversity. For example, according to a wide-ranging Canadian values study conducted just a few years ago, diversity has emerged as a bona fide embraced Canadian value. In other words, Canadians say, we know what diversity is, and we like it, and we realize the importance of it. In this nationwide survey, diversity was cited more than any other factor, including hockey, as the characteristic that makes Canada unique, way ahead of other characteristics such as universal health care, the weather, and so on. In other words, diversity has come to define Canada for many Canadians, and that likely helps immigrants to embrace Canada as their home foster. Indeed, some Canadian researchers have observed that the thinner sense of Canadian culture may actually have benefits in a multicultural era, making it easier for new Canadians to feel comfortable here. Canada is not a so-called melting pot for new immigrants, as is often the case of the United States. Immigrants to Canada throughout decades seem to hold on to their original heritage. We have English Canadians, we have French Canadians, we have Chinese Canadians, and so on. A Canadian is a hyphen, as novelist Joy Kawaja put it. Canada never has had race riots of the 1960s and the 1970s that the US experienced. We're perceived as exceptionally polite people. As Public Radio's Garrison Keillor in A Prairie Home Companion fame once said, and I quote, I look at Canadians and think, these are the people my mother always wanted me to hang out with in high school. <laughs> unquote. This view of Canadians as clean cut, nice people means that most people also see us as being very tolerant. But that's not the reality. Regretfully, racism and discrimination remain problems in Canada. For instance, um, the Institute for Research and Public Policy in Canada reveals that overall a third of racial minorities uh, report having experienced discrimination, a rate that varies from 28% of South Asians to 45% of black Canadians. More troubling is the evidence that the sense of discrimination is higher among immigrants who have been in the country longer and among the children of immigrants. I wonder if the same is true of young immigrants studying at Canadian universities and colleges. I suspect it is. What is more, we have a very serious problem in Canada with the economic integration of minorities. A recent study shows that only 40% of skilled immigrants are working in the occupation or profession for which they are trained. In fact, many uh, university degrees are, are, are working in jobs that typ typically require a high school or less. For example, there are a lot of um, Indians, uh, Chinese, Indonesians, Filipinos with PhDs who you'll see driving taxis in downtown Toronto or with MD degrees. It's no wonder, as a 2006 Statistics Canada study found, that one in six young, highly educated male immigrants leaves Canada within a year. That's indicative of latent racism. 
Many immigrants leave because their qualifications are not recognized and are largely undervalued in the Canadian job market. That's not right and that's not fair. As a Canadian, I know we have to turn this around. To create a truly inclusive society, we must ensure that all people, especially our young ones, have the same chance for personal and professional growth. We must recognize that systemic racism continues to impede the progress of visible minorities. And we must find solutions to bring about positive and enduring change. This is especially critical for universities as the seeds of future thought and action. Universities must recognize the business case for diversity. They must embrace the fact that diversity stimulates knowledge creation and it invigorates innovation and it attracts talent. I personally believe that every university and state college must become vibrantly diverse with at least 50% of their faculty and administrative staff from a broad range of races and cultures. That's because the thrust towards diversity will continue unabated, even more so with advances in digital, digital technology. As Thomas L. Friedman writes in his book, The World is Flat, A Brief History of the 21st Century, Dramatic advancements in information, networking, and communications technologies have reverberated across the globe. As a result, the playing field is being leveled. The world is becoming flat, all because we can communicate and collaborate as never before. We must leverage that new capability to the fullest extent possible. We must use it to create new and lasting bonds with other people in other parts of the world. This brings me to the second part of my talk today, the amazing impact of the ongoing digital transformation. I have to tell you, I am continually astounded at what technology can do for us and is doing on a daily basis. Technology is not just making it easier for people to communicate and connect. Now, with the advent of even smarter and smaller chips, trillions of things are also being connected. Everything from cars to roads to homes to appliances to health data and pacemakers. And these intelligent chips are rapidly imbuing ordinary things with extraordinary capabilities. There are sensors that can remotely control lighting systems, turning lights on and off according to the same time of day, or whether someone comes in or out or leaves a room. There are diagnostic sensors that can remotely monitor plant operations, detect when a part may break, and repair the damage before it has the chance to occur. And there are global positioning systems being used to locate new mineral deposits, to map traps of forests, and to help locate Alzheimer's patients. In short, an innovation in one industry can now be transferred to another of those industries in a matter of months. Consequently, every industry is fast becoming a knowledge-based industry. That's why it's so critical that universities get on the digital bandwagon. Every field of study, from the arts to music and film to the pure and applied sciences such as physics, chemistry and engineering is also being dramatically transformed by digitalization. Our universities and state colleges have to become smarter. Professors and students must be adept at understanding and leveraging all the advantages that are posed by digitalization. Universities must be wired end to end in all faculties, not just computer sciences. Their curriculums must acknowledge the advance of technology and how students are taught and what they are taught. Because what we are seeing today may well be just the beginning. Here are five examples of the trends to watch in the future. First, there is cloud computing, whereby even small organizations and businesses can have big business capabilities with minimal upfront costs and the ability to scale up quickly. Cloud computing enables a large number of dispersed computer systems to, to share an IT infrastructure. In other words, they can operate in a cloud. 
free of the limitations that once may have held them back and when their computer systems operated in isolation. Second, there is virtualization. Essentially, it enables one computer to do the job of several computers because of virtual servers and desktops that can host multiple operating systems and applications locally and in remote locations. In other words, the limitations of geography are now gone. Third, we are seeing an astounding uptake in notebook sales. In fact, the sale of these small, relatively inexpensive, yet powerful computers are now outpacing the sale of desktop computers. So the power of digitalization is within the grasp of many, many, many more people around the world today. A fourth important trend is the rise of open source software. Open source, as most of you know, eliminates licensing and upgrade costs, not to mention the cost of the initial software. Even running a supported version of the software is cheaper. Again, this means that technological intelligence is becoming more and more affordable and more and more people, for more and more people. And fifth, consider social networking. I'm sure that most people in this room do on a regular basis. How many of your professors are LinkedIn or ever watch YouTube or on Facebook or MySpace? And do they blog or Twitter? And I'm sure that most have ventured online and used at least one of these services. There are more than 200 million active users of Facebook and 110 million active users of MySpace in the world today. More than 3 million tweets are sent every day. YouTube receives 123 million views in a day. In their time, steam power, the railroad, and electricity transformed virtually everything. And what we have produced to how it is produced and how we organize to where we live and work. But since the 1990s, IT and the internet have uh, transformed these engines of change. And that change will continue on a daily basis. Moore's law has not slowed down. Processing power continues to double in mere seconds. As a result, computing power is almost free. For example, if we were to use 1975 technology today in 2009, it would cost about $100 million per user. 1995 technology would cost about $5,500. But five years ago, this same technology would cost $2. Possibilities that were once just fanciful dreams are becoming reality. In the pursuit of less invasive surgical techniques, for example, Canadian researchers created a touchy-feely robot earlier this year. It can detect tougher tumor tissue in one half the time and with 40% more accuracy than a human a human surgeon. Our technologies, of course, are also changing how we play. At Ariel's Thrill Laboratory in Britain, for instance, researchers are looking at physiological data to see how people react to different rides in an amusement park. They want to see how they can customize a ride so that it matches the thrill level for each and every rider. Who knows how this data will next be used? Conceivably, it, it could um, make it possible to check if a rider is healthy and fit and fit enough to take the ride. You could even combine it with sensor networks so that park visitors could check on the lineups for rides or find out where their friends and family are in the entire park. Right now, the iPhone is the fastest growing mobile device, and no wonder, it's really cool. But imagine what else it could do. You could potentially make it into a projector and show images on the wall, or build health diagnostics into it, or you could equip it with a, a sensor to measure your pulse and take your blood pressure readings at a regular time. 
Thomas Friedman believes that several types of talented people will prosper in this complex and ever-changing environment. One type will be the great explainers, people who can help others to understand today's complexity and what it means for all of us as human beings. A separate second type will be the great adapters, people who are able to stay one step ahead of the forces of our exploding technological innovation and its impacts on societies, people who can see the new opportunities on the horizon and take advantage of them. And a third type of people will be the great collaborators, people with the ability to work with others of different cultures and backgrounds. In other words, the only way to become a successful person today is to continually learn and to actively seek out new knowledge and to reach out to other people. And that's not an easy task, I know. It requires that you be very demanding of yourself it means that you must set personal goals and objectives. It compels you to work hard. As Michael Jordan maintains, quote, you have to expect things of yourself before you can do them. Developing these successful people uh, also compels universities and state colleges to re-examine their goals and their objectives. Diversity and digitalization must become their mantra. Universities and state colleges must take an active part in explaining the changes underway and in teaching people how to explain, explain the changes. As centers of research and nurturers of innovation, universities must take center stage in nurturing the great adapters of the future, the students, and to help develop the great collaborators who will thrive in the future, and universities must put their students into contact with a wide range of diverse peoples every day. Moreover, both students and universities that welcome them must consider their place in the world today, not just in their own city or in their own country, but in the world. North America has long been the hub of innovation in the world. Other peoples watched us to see what was new and what was exciting. But that could change. For example, today's technologies have spawned outsourcing and offshoring, which have lifted India and China, once two of the poorest nations on earth, into global economic powerhouses. Together, these two nations account for one-third of the planet's population. Over the past two decades, China's economy has grown at an astounding 9.5% a year and India's by 6%. Some experts believe that India will surpass Germany to become the world's third biggest economy within three decades. By mid-century, China will overtake the United States as the world's largest economy. By then, China and India could account for one half of global output, China and India. What is more, China and India are fast becoming hubs of technological innovation in manufacturing software and a host of other areas. Just 20 years ago, this situation was unimaginable. Back then, East Asia was the poorest region of the world. Now, it is a leader in poverty reduction, according to the World Bank. Astounding economic growth in the region has pulled more than 500 million people out of poverty, and the GDP per capita has tripled. Consequently, almost a billion new customers will enter global marketplace in the next decade. And by the year 2015, consumer spending power in these emerging markets is expected to reach more than $9 trillion, more than double the spending power that they have today. Meanwhile, um, a massive problem is looming for most advanced societies. 
a growing scarcity of well-trained knowledge workers. With the graying of the baby boomers and a declining birth rate, Canada is increasingly dependent on immigration to grow its workforce. So are other developed countries. Immigrants now account for two-thirds of the population growth for the 30-member countries of the OECD. And in the introduction that was given to you about me, it was said that one of the things that I do is to operate a Christmas tree farm, and we, operate, we export Christmas trees around the world. The people who are working on my trees doing the labor work now come from Mexico, all the way from Mexico all the way up to the east coast of, no of Canada to Nova Scotia. We don't have enough workers to do it. And that's not even skilled workers, but for our aerospace plants and so on, we have to look to immigration for those skilled workers. I realize the United States doesn't face the same problem. Your problem continues to grow because the birth rate has not abated. Your population continues to grow because the birth rate has not abated as it has in Canada. Nevertheless, I also know that the US continues to welcome new immigrants to its shores. Your country remains the great melting pot with a rich, rich diversity of cultures and races. But like Canada, the United States continues to struggle with systemic racism. Consider the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, for instance. Hundreds of thousands of people, largely black, poor, and elderly, were left behind. It underscored that a great racial divide still exists. It brought home the fact that this divide can have life or death consequences. Allow me to sum up. As I've discussed, the twin forces of diversity and digitalization are rocking our world. In the face of global talent crunch, the demographic profile of many other Western countries is rapidly changing. Diversity has truly become part and parcel of Canada's magnificent mosaic and America's glorious melting pot and it is demanding that we create a more inclusive culture. Meanwhile, technological change continues to revolutionize the way we live and work in previously unimaginable ways. And together, diversity and digitalization are shifting the tides of world trade and prosperity. Consequently, the traditional centers of power, wealth, and influence are no longer focused solely in our part of the world. As Robert D. Putnam, a professor at Harvard and the University of Manchester in Britain believes, quote, one of the most important challenges facing modern societies and at the same time, one of our most significant opportunities is the increase in ethnic and social heterogeneity in virtually all advanced countries, unquote. And as he further maintains, quote, the most certain prediction that we can make about almost any modern society is that it will be more diverse a generation from now than it is today. To achieve success in this continually mut mutating environment with all of its unexpected risks, and in all its glorious opportunities, universities and state colleges and the people who learn there must gain a world view. You have to have a world outlook on things. They will be technologically savvy, not only knowing how to use technology, but knowing what technology can do, how it can connect people and things in new ways, and how it can change what we do and how we do it every day. And above all, students and universities must embrace inclusiveness and openness and receptivity to the views, the beliefs, and the ambitions of others, especially those from different cultures and backgrounds. Our world, our country, and the cities we live in are now uh, dramatically pluralistic. Consequently, an understanding of and the ability to relate to the diversity of peoples have become essential. 
I would like to quote with the expression from Nelson Mandela that was read before. Nelson Mandela once observed that a good head and a good heart are always a formidable combination. Make that combination your combination. Make a difference. Improve the world. Thank you very much. <laughs>